So many things that make this place our home. Home is just the backdrop of our lives. You know, home is the place where when you close the door, you control what's around you. You know, it's where you dream, it's where you recover, it's where you uh, stay safe from a pandemic. Home is family, 100% family. And you're gonna make me cry because <laughs> everybody's grown up now and you don't see them as much. Home is where your family is. Home's where there is love. Home to me is the place where you feel the most secure and the most known. It's also the place where you can dream and, and hope. What I think about home was actually a family friend uh, that helped raise me in many respects. And she, uh, she was phenomenal. And that going to her house was going home. Home is a place where I can bring my grandson. And I would just want my kids to have the best backyard, trampoline, swimming pool. I think home is about being grounded. To be able to see the sun rise um, in my apartment. I'm ending another chapter and I'm starting a new chapter, so it's really, it's gonna be really good. It's not just where we sleep, it's where we live. It's where on summer nights we break down and forgive. It's where the kids come home and they're almost grown, they ease into their souls. So many things that make this place our home. I'm Jennifer Ho, and I am the Commissioner of Minnesota Housing Today. We build and preserve housing. You know, we work to end homelessness. We work to help people with disabilities. When you're out there at a groundbreaking, you know, a ribbon cutting, like, you know that you're at a place that people who probably haven't had a very, very stable housing history are going to be given the opportunity of a lifetime to have a home of their own. And I mean, that's a powerful thing. I mean, that's a really powerful thing. A half century milestone providing access to safe and affordable housing, yet an acceleration of progress is still needed to close persistent housing disparities and build a secure future. To look forward, we first turn back to where Minnesota housing began more than 50 years ago. The 50th anniversary is a celebration that has an arc. I think knowing where you come from is important. Minnesota has a housing crisis. It is a crisis for the family anywhere in Minnesota that needs housing. It is a crisis even more severe for minority families excluded from decent housing because of race as well as income. It is a crisis for the middle income family unable to meet housing needs. So it's today's message written in 1971. I'm Jim Solom. I was involved with the Housing Finance Agency from day one. I'm closer to 86 than 85, and who would have thought you'd be around 50 years. It was a really tiny staff to do everything that we had in mind. I was the 13th employee. I think I might be the only person who's ever worked in all four locations of the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency. I just was excited to get started because it had such a reputation of being uh, an innovative place to be and so much promise. Now, in the 1950s, the United States went from a nation of renters to a nation of homeowners. The federal government's role in housing went from just public housing to getting involved with tax policy, with regulating the securities industry, which involved bringing capital to housing. There were like eight or 10 state housing and finance agencies around the country. So I was given the task of trying to figure out what they were and how would you get one to work in Minnesota? 
When Jim Solem brought the idea to then-Governor Wendell Anderson, the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency was born. Seven leaders have brought the agency from 1971 to where it stands today, at its fourth location in downtown St. Paul. And this is important. The Minnesota Housing Finance Agency was a state agency from day one. The legislature provided oversight, so for many years, there was no other state in the country had the mix of programs that we had here in Minnesota. We did the second low-income housing tax credit deal ever done. 35 years later, it is still the main way in which we produce affordable rental housing. It's the longest lasting federal housing program we've had. We also, during this time, and I'm very proud of this, we focused a lot on trying to expand the housing that is the most deeply affordable. And it was always so gratifying to go to groundbreakings and ribbon cuttings and realize that people with very little income could live in an affordable way. I go past these developments now. I drive by them, I think. Yeah, we help make that happen. There is this human aspect to the work that we do. It's not just the financials and reviewing all the numbers and all of that is important. It's about providing that space. You have an extraordinary group of talented people that even more than their talent, they are committed to the mission here at Minnesota Housing. You think about like the major periods in our past, the creation of, of tax credit financing, the creation of the housing infrastructure bonds. What's the next new? And how do those tools actually center the experience of communities who desperately need better housing that's affordable to them and their families? If someone would have, would have said 50 years ago that the agency is going to do a billion dollars worth of business, we wouldn't have known how to react or respond because there'd been no context for that. And, you know, agencies don't last 50 years. Uh, and this one has and done remarkably well. Home is is where we build our lives. And uh, we'll just make sure that we take a moment and, and you know, honor, honor the history and dream of the future. city and in a community and in a state and a nation without homelessness. A movement that says that it's unacceptable. I think the most egregious form of housing injustice is homelessness. Our role in ending homelessness is the creation of housing that people can get in. Right here. Your own room. And young man, show me where you live. My name is Essence, and I'm a mother of three children, two boys and one girl. Like we've been homeless uh, all together for like six months. So we've been moving house to house, couches, floors, you know, anything to make sure we, you know, stay comfortable. I love my kids to death. I wouldn't even lie, if it weren't for my kids, I probably wouldn't even be here breathing on this earth. It's a perfect day. You know, every day is a good day, actually. Essence left Illinois to escape an abusive relationship. People Serving People's Shelter in Minneapolis helped give her a new start. She joined the county's coordinated entry process, which matches people experiencing homelessness with affordable housing units. Two weeks later, I received a phone call 
saying um, that I was accepted. It was a lot of weight took it off my shoulders to just know that I can start back cooking meals. I was a ravioli. Almost half of all people who are homeless in our state are children. They're in almost every school district in the state. You just bring it over here. Even children who've had one episode of homelessness um, tend to have an impact in their educational achievement for years and years to come, even after one episode. I feel like I could do some homework up here. The latest numbers from Minnesota Housing show overall chronic homelessness is up almost 50%, and the number of people sleeping outdoors is way up, a 145% increase since 2014. The light rail in the metro area is frankly one of the largest homeless shelters in the state because that's where people sleep at night. Throughout my tenure, we started thinking a lot about funding permanent housing as opposed to transitional housing because people had really been focused on building shelters and doing this transitional housing stuff. And it just wasn't very effective. And so this was a little bit of a change for the agency, I perceive, to say, we are going to climb that hill. We are going to end long-term homelessness. And we're going to develop a plan in partnership with the entire community with timetables, with dollars, with number of housing opportunities that will come on each year. We are all in this together. Tim helped usher Minnesota and our national conversation on homelessness into a new era. What a spectacular morning. So many things to celebrate and give thanks for. This is the second building of our uh, the Dorothy Day Place campus, which uh, this one opened in 2019. It's been sometimes it moved to tears to see people move into these rooms. They're so excited. It's the first time for some in years that they've had a key. That they've been able to go into a place, close the door, lock it, and be safe and alone. We could see the largest shift in the kind of investments in housing and supports and homelessness that we've ever seen, in, at least in my lifetime. I think what's so important is that people with lived experience of homelessness are really at the center of this conversation. What does housing justice and health justice and racial justice really look like for, for people in our state? And I think one of the things it looks like is that they don't fall into homelessness in the first place. <laughs> She started sleeping through the night after we moved here. Probably because it's peaceful and she knows she's comfortable now. So, because it's been a long time. Uh, it's nap time. I know I've accomplished something huge. But right now, I look at it like it's it's this is just the beginning. Cause it's not just where we sleep, it's where we live It's where the walls are lined with all the lives we've lived It's where the family fills that old wood table Make more bread and bring more chairs It's nights like these that make this place our home It's nights like these that make this place our home so many things that make this place our home. Affordable housing is not what most people think affordable housing is. You know, there's often this image that comes up of the concrete tower. Uh, that is falling apart or isn't well maintained, and that just isn't the reality anymore. This is your room. Wow. Hey, look at this view right here. Look at this view. What's that? That's a park. That is a park. Do you like it? Yeah. Being able to find this specific housing unit under the price that I was looking for, um, it was a blessing and I found out that it was an affordable housing program. 
this is the best part of the whole apartment is the kitchen and living room area. Um, it is a huge open floor plan. Um, brand new appliances, lots of space. <laughs> My kids, they are twins. They are two boys. They're three years old. Uh, being a single mom is really difficult. Being their mom is probably the best I could ever, you know, imagine. So it's really good. In the last three years, me and my kids were going through a lot. We were living at my mom's house for the last year. So being able to finally be on my own, and it's a little scary for me because I'm by myself with my children, you know? But they have, she had to go on her own. So it's nice to, to see her make a big step. A bat. That is a bat. Good That's job. I told them that mommy bought a house and they asked me if I bought it at the store and I said yes, of course. <laughs> He's so excited. <laughs> it was really hard to find an apartment and a place to live. Now we have it, we are so happy. <laughs> the Sound on 76 is the first intentional affordable development in Edina in 25 years. A collaboration between the county, city, and other funding partners to provide units for families. This is amazing. It's home. Home is where you don't have to pick your stuff up and move it someplace Ooh. else. I know you had to be perseverant in getting funding. I always say, we never say no, we just say not yet, and it's because we don't have enough resources, right? So thanks for sticking with it. Yes, we really were very appreciate excited that. about this project. The affordable housing that is getting developed now is virtually indistinguishable from any other project around it, and that is intentional. What we want is housing that people feel valued in. Part of that intentional effort are investments in supportive housing, too. Since 2004, Minnesota Housing has served nearly 8,000 households through supportive housing. Housing infrastructure bonds are critical in creating supportive housing developments as a strategy to end long-term homelessness. Supportive housing is a place that is both affordable and helps you with access to the kinds of services you need to be successful and stable in your housing. The definition of home is that place where you can just finally exhale. Uh, a home is that place where you can just let your hair down. Wow. Welcome to Mailwood Apartments. Supportive housing is affordable housing that you can afford to pay with, with on-site supportive services that help you with what you need help with. I don't, I don't think it's rocket science, like being inside, having your own place, being safe. It's what you need and it's magical and people's lives change as a result of that. So when we look at overall tools related to developing and preserving affordable rental homes, the easy answer when people ask, what do we need to get more of that done? They're all going to be one bedroom units. The easy answer, honestly, is more funding. And that is something that our colleagues here at Minnesota Housing and really around the country are doing to advocate for more funding. And so I was uh, so grateful in 2012 that a Republican legislature was the first to approve $30 million in housing infrastructure bonds. It was a name that we uh, created to convey the idea that housing really is a, as much a part of the state's infrastructure as roads and bridges. There, I filled the hole. We are up here in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. Beautiful Grand Rapids on this summer day. But what's really important are the 56 homes. It brings safety, it brings stability, it brings home.
there's a lot of new jobs coming to Grand Rapids and there's no vacancy. We need more housing, all forms, whether it's even single family housing, multifamily housing, affordable housing, market rate workforce housing. It's, there's a shortage of all of them. If I had one wish, as we develop more affordable housing or preserve more affordable housing, the rents are still often out of reach of many households. What we need more investment in is that rental assistance side, meeting people where they are at, where their families are at. I feel safe, I feel welcomed. I can't wait to wake up, feel the sun, cook a little breakfast for the boys, and be able to um, just look out and see this beautiful view that, that we have. It is time for us to take the next step, to turn the page, and to move on from, you know, the past where it wasn't so good, and hopefully go into the future uh, with open arms and big smiles and happy faces. are safe here no need to run or pack up your things every day here we can start again is safety. Home is being comfortable in your own skin. Home is having that outlet from the, the, the world. And this is my home. This is my living room. Honestly, it's my favorite area just to think, um, entertain. My kitchen where I try to uh, cook. <laughs> But I've been, I've been kind of successful on it. It's a little, a little smaller than I wanted it to be, but really cozy and I love it. So. But there's one feature in Maurice's St. Louis way. Park condo that stands out above it all. That, that I own it, you know? And it's like, hey, this is mine. At 24 years old. And then we're gonna go down the hallway. Maurice is taking a sure-footed leap towards wealth building, knowing the homeownership disparities stacked against him. My favorite room. Among white Minnesotans, more than three out of four own homes. Just over half of Minnesotans of color own homes. But for black Minnesotans, fewer than one out of three are homeowners. Compare that to black homeownership rates back in 1950, when 46% of black families owned their homes. But the rate has dropped almost half since then. Seeing people that look like me, just gives me that more, more of that confidence. Maurice enrolled in first-time homebuyer classes with Project for Pride in Living to seek guidance navigating the complexities of credit and mortgages. Oh my goodness, yes. Those, those classes are, I just feel like they're, they're, they should be mandatory in a sense. It just makes me feel uh, accomplished, you know, um, a major, major milestone in my life. I always remember growing up how important home ownership was to my parents. So my family is from Vietnam. We um, escaped during uh, the fall of Saigon. We lived in an apartment for a number of years until my parents were able to save enough uh, money to purchase a home. There weren't very many pictures back then, but we did have one picture where we, uh, we stood in front of the house with our sponsors that helped us come over from Vietnam, and it was pretty incredible. In Minnesota housing single family division, Casey Keir learned firsthand how home ownership, long seen as the cornerstone of the American dream, is also haunted by decades of discriminatory practices. And Minnesota's home ownership disparity gap still has a persistent inequity compared to the rest of the country. 
what you'll probably also hear that the homeownership disparity between white households um, and black households uh, is the worst in the nation. So it's unacceptably low. A direct reflection of historical racist practices from redlining, racial covenants written into deeds, and predatory lending, especially during the Great Recession. A history that hits close to home for Commissioner Jennifer Ho. I was sad but not surprised to learn that my mother's father probably intimidated uh, black homeowners who moved into their neighborhood when my mother was young. You know, my mom is uh, a Minnesotan descendant of, of German and Swedish immigrants, farmers. My father was born in Hawaii before statehood. Um, he's Chinese, he's native Hawaiian. I grew up in a multicultural household that didn't always own the fact that it was a multicultural household. Having learned that, am I proud of that? No, but is it important for me to understand that that's part of my family's history? Yes. The work that we do lending to first-time homebuyers of color, some of the most exciting uh, work this, this agency you know, has done over the last decade, and I, and I in inherited that. A decade ago, about 23% of Minnesota housing's loans to first-time home buyers went to families of color. Today, that's jumped to 40% of loans going to families of color and still climbing. We got results, and those are results that we've continued to build on year after year. We also need to develop programs that work for people of color, making sure that we have down payment and closing cost assistance, uh, having trusted advisors to help bridge the knowledge gap in what it takes and what the path to home ownership is. As we think about the next 50 years, I think that we have to figure out how to not leave so many people behind um, in terms of the accumulation of wealth. And we need to figure out how to make communities that work for everybody, and that starts with our homes. This is my favorite room of the condo, and as you can tell, I have a problem, so. Maurice can only hope that others do walk in his shoes. As a first-time home buyer, understanding the comfort that comes with closing the gap. Home is personality. Home is just a reflection of who you are and who you love and who you associate with and everything like that. I feel like that's what home is to me. The disadvantaging of black and brown and indigenous families and the advantaging of white families was baked into the package all the way from the very beginning. You know, so I think it's really important to know our stories, to know the story of Rondo in 94, to know the story of the South Side in 35. White people chose to build interstates right through those black homeownership neighborhoods. From a statewide perspective, our homeownership racial disparity gap is the fourth worst in the nation between white households um, and black households. And these homeownership disparity gaps aren't by accident. It's been decades of discriminatory and racist lending practices, redlining, racial covenants. It will take a long time to resolve. It's not a history that you appreciate. It is, a, it is a demand to rethink things that have always been the way that they are. Recognizing past harms, Minnesota housing shines a light on communities left behind. Rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sabathony Community Center's new senior housing project addresses the growing displacement of South Minneapolis seniors. The hope is it will revitalize this black community with a vibrant history dating back to the 1960s. Yes, the black legacy continues. This is truly a labor of love. Three. We committed to building affordable senior housing 
in every ward in the city of Minneapolis. I'm proud to say this is the first, but I'm also sad because we need many, many more. And I'm 97. Years young. <laughs> yeah, years young. <laughs> to be in a smaller place like this, it's wonderful. Behind the construction of this building are Black-owned partners central to a plan to revive the 38th Street Corridor back to its cultural identity. So please welcome the Sabathony Vintage Voices. This is the best kind of day to be a commissioner. This is what a discussion at the Capitol about whether or not we need housing infrastructure bonds. We need homes like this. Especially as we saw the social unrest uh, following the murder of George Floyd. It's brought the issue of inequities in income, health, education, home ownership to the forefront. It's accelerated our need to understand how we embed racial justice and race equity in our work of the agency. Getting a director of equity and inclusion uh, into the agency to help us figure out how to do that work. Minnesota Housing is one of only five housing finance agencies in the country to create an executive role leading diversity, equity, inclusion, State and anti-racism work. Our history does matter. A new director and taking the helm in 2021. We also need to diversify the industry and recruit people of color as lenders, as real estate professionals. Minnesota Housing also focuses equity efforts across the state to places like Onamia, in the heart of the Mille Lacs tribal economy. <laughs> New manufactured housing construction techniques help fill a needed gap to create sustainability for the local workforce. We build everything indoors so we don't have the elements against us. Typically, we can turn around a home in three weeks. Now, as more than 30 families receive high quality, affordable housing, the Red Willow Estates could be a new model for both rural Minnesota and tribal partnerships. It's surreal because this has been such a long project, two, three years, so many hurdles I think people don't see in these small communities. And then when you kind of add on like the complexity of like tribal communities, the reality is if we don't help kind of bridge those gaps, like the things just don't happen. been to create homes, not institutions, not buildings, but to create homes. We pride ourselves in, in using Native American workers and, and opportunities because my grandfather always told me that the people that go before us will always guide your way. Here in Minnesota, we have seen more black, indigenous, and people of color that own development companies try to move into this space, but we're really in those early stages. We also need to develop programs that work for people of color, making sure that we have down payment and closing cost assistance. It does keep me up at night. You know, it's something here that I think that my team is so committed to working on. Let justice roll. And so this is the beginning of the work. And thank you to all of you, the community, who have continuously stepped up and pushed us to do the right thing in this community and in the city of Minneapolis. Thank you all so much. my ice sculptures, it puts a smile on people's faces, I've been told. We are at Woodlawn Terrace 
Cooperative, and I am the president of the Resident Association. My name is Bev Adrian. I moved here uh, about 15 months ago and started a movement. <laughs> I'm sorry, I crack myself up sometimes. <laughs> meeting to order. Bev Adrian never meant to become a mobile home activist. Does anybody want to make a motion to approve the minutes? But when she learned the owner of Woodlawn Terrace might sell, Bev had been down this road before when her prior community sold. I understand that the homes have been ordered. She knew a co-op, a collective purchase of the land beneath their homes. My heart's still pounding. <laughs> would be the only way to secure their future. Save the day. Since 2020, Minnesota Housing has invested more than 10 million in manufactured housing, improving more than 1,500 lots in 17 communities. A new program redevelops private, city, and co-op models and helps owners rehab or even relocate. Woodlawn Terrace is among the first in this new effort to fight a national trend of manufactured homes bought out by investors, uprooting residents. It's safe, it's warm, it's absolutely just completely normal living. It's just a little bit different kind of a home. And people don't realize how comfortable mobile home living is, especially with updated models. We're just extremely excited to be um, partnering with Minnesota Housing because it's going to make options available for other parks. This is just one week old, so <laughs> <laughs> we're still giddy. <laughs> This is just a rare opportunity. This is just exceptional. We're in Park Plaza Cooperative and right now we're driving around to take a little tour of what it's like inside of our community. So this house right here is what a 1960 house looks like. Everyone owns a piece of the pie, basically. So we all own the land underneath our homes, and with that, we've managed to marry our homes to our land, and no one can change that. So we'll never be up for sale. You'll never be displaced. In Fridley, Park Plaza has proven the success of a co-op formed more than a decade ago. This is big time affordable. We pay $5.28 here a month. Where are you gonna pay that anywhere else right now? Board President Natividad Seafeld spearheaded the co-op when her community went up for sale too. And now she's led the way, replacing a rundown water and sewer system, repaving roads, even adding a playground. To Natividad, the only way to realize a dream is to live it. This is close-knit families here. We're all, we all know each other and you can depend on each other. And Hi, baby. It's, it's been the best thing that I've ever done. We are entering the Storm Shelter and Community Center for Park Plaza Cooperative. Park Plaza received $425,000 from Minnesota Housing to build this storm shelter, a safe space doubling as a community center for a diverse community of more than 80 families. Everything we do is better together. So we are going inside my house. This is a 1979 home that needs Quite a bit of work, so come on in. <laughs> How's that for Christmas? So many reasons to celebrate, but more than anything, at home, Natividad never feels alone. Go, baby, it's your birthday. Go, baby, Woo! it's your birthday. Yeah, you are so pretty. I love you. So I had no idea what living in a manufactured home was going to be like. That connectivity is so important, and when you turn into a co-op, you get that. They're not your real family, but they turn into your real family here, and <laughs> I've tried really hard not to cry. Um, seen a lot of change. We've seen a lot of happy times, a lot of bad times, but still, it's your home, it's your land, and you're not going anywhere. <laughs> it's so cool. It really is. The fact that you now own it means that you can control the investments, you can control the quality. I want you to know the state of Minnesota has your back. We're excited for you. Um, we're excited about what you're doing. I'm so glad that you all came to join us today to celebrate what we accomplished. Thank you. 
over the last 30 years in the Twin Cities, half of all the parks that have unfortunately closed and displaced the people living there have been in Hennepin County. So this is a huge uh, turnaround to uh, the first in Hennepin County being preserved uh, by the residents. So this is, this is just amazing. Well, you did a good job. Yeah. Congratulations. This I call the stairway to heaven. <laughs> well, it is heavenly, right? You own your community now. So is that a two bedroom? Oh, it is bigger. It is bigger. Oh. Nice closet doors. For Bev and Richfield, and not to be Dodd and Fridley, the two make sure their mobile home communities are no longer a site of stigma, but the new oh. face of affordable housing. Stainless. Here to stay. Uh-huh, and look at that stove. Everything that I have done in my whole life has culminated in this explosion experience. And it's just so gratifying. It's so, I get teary. <laughs> we just get teary. Never in my wildest dream. But to be living it, you know, for to really to have happened. It is a movement. It is. weather. <laughs> Groundbreakings we oftentimes do with cold ears and warm hearts. Every leader gets a curveball and we got one that's kind of triply charged because uh, we've got the health crisis, we have the economic crisis, and then we've got the protests for racial justice that came after the murder of George Floyd. The whole world's watching! I just think that, that housing has moved from being uh, a back seat or maybe in the trailer being pulled issue to being a front seat issue. You know, it's universal. I mean, you know, everybody needs a home. It's just that some people don't have to think about it. And never once have I stopped believing that we can end homelessness. I think the important distinction, though, is the question of will we end homelessness? Yes, we can solve it. The issue is, do we want to? And do we have the political will to do it? And, and I uh, am sad, sometimes heartbroken, that in spite of the resources and the effort, we can still go to downtown St. Paul, Minneapolis, other parts, and see people in encampments. It doesn't have to be that way. A costly burden across Minnesota with over 400,000 households with incomes less than $50,000 a year, spending more than 30% of their income on housing alone. So I would focus on production, 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 and renovation, 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 and then the combination of housing and services, and we know we have models to do that. We know how to do that. All the while, construction costs skyrocket, rents rapidly rise, incomes stagnate, and now higher interest rates make it harder to buy a home, all adding up to a future in flux, especially for those experiencing housing instability. We feel it, I feel it, on how big the need is and how much work that we are trying to put into this. Uh, to increase access to housing. It is deeply, deeply important to us. What gives me so much optimism, there is no better place to do this work than in Minnesota. No more of a supportive community. Levels of investments and buy-in from business, from foundations and others. The agency has survived with its reputation intact, with marvelous people, and with a continued record of innovation and creativity and commitment what might the meaning of home look like for all Minnesotans in another 50 years? For Minnesota housing, it's a lesson and a recognition. The next half century cannot leave so many behind. The work continues and it begins with who we are and how we dream and where we live. And so I guess what I would love to say if I came back here in my final, final chapter is the coolest thing happened 
after I left. And it's when housing finance actually became a tool that was centered around communities of color and people who made the least and people experiencing homelessness. And that's when we saw things really break open. It's not just where we sleep, it's where we live. It's where on summer nights we break down and forgive. It's where the kids come home and they're almost grown. To their souls, so many things that make this place our home. I promise to keep singing if you ask me to. We'll paint the kitchen green, we'll make your bedroom blue. It's not been easy, love, but look at you. You're curled up by the window and you look brand new. It's not just where we sleep, it's where we live. come home and they're almost grown they ease into their souls so many things that make this place our home It's where we sleep, it's where we live It's where the walls are lined with all the lives we've lived It's where the family fills that old wood table Make more bread and bring more chairs It's nights like these that make this place our home It's nights like these that make this place our home our home